Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. We are so happy to have all of you with us. Uh, it is the second week in Lent, uh, so hopefully all your fastings are doing, going okay, all the chocolates tucked away, uh, all, the, all those kinds of things. Um, this morning we'll be meditating on the extraordinary love of our God, uh, especially in our fifth reading where Paul talks about that God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so what a wonderful message we'll hear this morning. And then we'll start with our opening hymn, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, LSB 611. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Lenten journey continues toward the cross. It is a journey marked with suffering, but suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope and hope in Christ does not put us to shame. Our hope in Christ is strong and living, yet we have often taken for granted the profound reality of Christ's death for us. We have ignored how weak and ungodly we have been. Still, our Heavenly Father grants us access to his throne of grace to ask for his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we have not rejoiced in suffering, but have given up easily. We have lacked integrity and acted shamefully. 
and we have even despaired of life itself. Have mercy upon us and reconcile us back to you so that we may rejoice once more on account of Jesus. Amen. At just the right time, while we were still weak and ungodly, Jesus died for us and reconciled us to God. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are forgiven and are at peace with God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in your perfect timing, you died for us who are weak and ungodly. Be present with us as we endure the suffering of this world so that we may learn how suffering leads to endurance, character, and hope that never puts us to shame. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for the second Sunday in Lent comes from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now read Psalm 22 responsively, and we begin together. I will tell of your name to my brother. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in all of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. I will tell your name to my brother. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Our epistle reading comes from Romans 
chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The congregation, please rise for the verse and the reading of the Holy Gospel. If anyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory, of, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And we invite the children forward for a children's message. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome up front here. I have a question for you, and I want to see it by the raise of your hands. How many of you have ever been duck hunting? Anybody ever been duck hunting? Okay, maybe one or one or two. Okay. What do you have to have to go duck hunting? For those of you who have gone, what do you think you need? If you're going to go home with a duck, what do you need? You got to have some ducks. Yeah, you got to have some duck hunting. You probably got to have a good bird dog, right, to go out and fetch the bird for you. Uh, you got to have a gun at some point in time, and maybe a really, uh, another really important thing is a duck call, too, right? 
Can I hear all of your duck sounds this morning? What does a duck sound like? Right? Yeah, all right. Good job, everybody. Good job. Yeah, you guys sound like ducks. Wow, that's really good. So uh, what the purpose of a duck call is, is to really lure the duck in. That's what the hunter is trying to do. Um, and why I talk about duck hunting this morning is because in our gospel reading, uh, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And people had all kinds of different answers. Uh, some people said Elijah. Some people said maybe you're John the Baptist. Maybe you're one of the other prophets, all that other stuff. Um, but Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter turns to him and says, well, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And so Jesus says, yeah, that's the right answer. That's the one you really need. And so you don't want to be listening to all the different things that like everybody else is saying, but you want to listen to exactly what Jesus tells us who he is, right? We want to get that name right. We want to make sure that we are listening to the right Jesus who is the Christ. So let's go ahead and pray. Give God thanks for giving us Jesus and giving us his name, right? Go ahead and pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for calling me by my name. In your name I pray. Amen. You may return to your seats. We'll continue with our sermon hymn, Lord Thee I Love With All My Heart, LSB 708.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, Pastor Waymeyer preached about a life of receptivity. And he gave the examples of sometimes when you identify yourselves, it's in, in, in an active way. And this is your resume, this is the, all of your list of accomplishments that you have, all those things. Uh, and then there's the receptive type of identification, which is maybe the family you were born into. So you give someone your last name uh, and what that, what that means and all the baggage that goes along with that. Uh, and we finally settled on that the Christian life is ultimately one that is totally and utterly received by Jesus Christ himself. And today we hear a very similar message, especially when we hear from St. Paul in Romans chapter 5, that God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, because the way that we like to interact with one another is we like to see what we like and go after that. And so I'll give you a few examples of this. Uh, let's just uh, picture a young couple. Uh, they're, they want to find lifelong love. They haven't met each other yet. So they've been set up by friends. This is a blind date. Uh, but they're tired of just dating around. And they're, they're finally ready to meet perfect, you know, the, the perfect one that they're going to be with for the rest of their life. And so uh, the girl, she gets herself ready. She's wearing a dress. She probably spends 40 or so minutes on her hair and makeup. And she has a list of questions that she has going in her brain. And she has all of her answers perfectly polished so that she can keep that conversation going. The guy, well, he shows up to the date 10 minutes late. He's not, he's not quite shaved. He doesn't look quite nice. His hair or his clothes are all wrinkly. And he cannot keep the conversation going to save his life. And his table manners are absolutely atrocious. So what is the guy sitting there thinking? The guy is sitting there thinking, I have met the most beautiful woman I have ever met in my entire life. I have scored big time, right? And the, and the girl is sitting there thinking, get me out of here. <laughs> I don't want to be at this date anymore. I think I'm going to have to go visit the little girl's room and never, ever return to this ever. I might not even go back to this restaurant again because of the bad memories here. We like to find what, what attracts us to each other. Uh, another scenario, uh, if you can picture a company, a company trying to, again, looking for uh, more consistency, tired of people just using them to leverage their position at that company for a higher pay somewhere else. And so one guy comes in, uh, binder, you know, everything's laminated, everything's color-coded, he's dressed professionally, and he has his answers ready. But then another guy comes in 10 minutes late, uh, he's, he's not polished at all, just is not the right candidate. And so by the time the second guy walks in late, they're already saying you're hired to the first guy, the first guy who actually presented himself really well. Because we go off of appearances. And I think in a lot of ways, this is a good thing. This is a good thing as we interact with each other because I don't think any self-respecting gal wants to be with a loser for the rest of her life. And I don't think a company wants a non-starter for an employee. And so, yes, we, we have to go off appearances because that's what we know. That's how we're able to judge how people think about us, of how, how they dress. And that's why when we hear about the love of our God, it's totally backwards to us. That Jesus would look at us, that God would look at us. When we were at our most miserable state, when we were blind, when we were dead, and when we were actually enemies of God, and that he would sacrifice his own life for us poor, miserable sinners. And see, the thing is, as we follow Jesus, there are times where we might want to apply this appearance type thing to Jesus himself. But it just doesn't work because I gotta tell you this morning, there is actually nothing earthly attractive about our God, about Jesus, physically even. We are told that Jesus is not physically attractive. When the prophet Isaiah writes about the Messiah to come, he writes in Isaiah 53 that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and that he had no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus was not the type of guy that you'd kind of look at going down the street saying, hey, that's a pretty good looking guy. I think I want to follow him a little more. And then you listen to his words, you listen to his preaching, you listen to his, actually how he thinks about life, and that's nothing to be desired either. Because we even heard in our gospel reading today that... 
if you would want to follow me, you have to pick up your cross, a torture device. You would have to pick up your cross and follow me. You would have to pick up a life of pain. You would have to pick up a life of sorrow when you follow Jesus. And that goes totally contrary to what we want. We would like to follow someone who is attractive, someone who is easy on the eyes. We like to follow someone who makes our life easier, not more difficult. So when we look at our Lord Jesus, someone who's physically unattractive and someone who's actually calling us to a more difficult life, all of our earthly instincts are saying, whoa, 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 red flags. Don't follow this guy. Because we want to follow someone we like. To help us make sense of this, uh, Luther writes in his Heidelberg Disputation, so there's, there's 28 theses in the Heidelberg Disputation. You say, wow, that's, that's a mouthful. But everybody knows the 95 theses that were nailed to the castle door at Wittenberg. Everybody knows the 95 theses, but not everybody knows these 28 little beauties of the Heidelberg Disputation. Because everything that goes along in here, what Luther is trying to argue throughout this entire thing is he's trying to make this distinction between a theologian of glory and a theologian of the cross. And throughout the entire thing, Luther is trying to say, hey, you never ever want to be a theologian of glory. This is someone who has convinced themselves that they have seen the beauty of God, they've, they've seen the attractive beauty of God outside of word and sacraments. Let me paint this image for you. This is the person who says they are spiritual but not religious. This is the person who says, well, I believe in Jesus and I love that he loves me and I know I love Jesus, but I don't need church and I don't need to come to hear his preaching and I don't need to receive his sacraments. Let me give you a visual. This is the one who uh, sticks their ear full of cotton swabs. They plug their nose and they cover their eyes and say, nope, I think this is how Jesus wants me to live. I don't need anything else. I'm fine just like this. Are you serious? No, this is not how we have been called to live our life. That we would actually block out these gifts that God has been given to us. That we would refuse Jesus' body and blood. That we would refuse to hear again each week, and as often as we can, we would refuse to hear the, the beautiful words and promises of our God freshly for this new day. This is a theologian of glory who thinks that they have it all figured out this way. What Luther argues, that any self-respecting, Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian has to be a theologian of the cross. They have to be someone who is desperately aware of their need for a Savior. Someone who realizes that they sin daily and much. That each and every day of their life they have to drown and, die and kill that old Adam through the waters of holy baptism. Luther says this when he talks about uh, the way that we should be viewing ourselves in, in, relationship, in relationship to the cross. He says these words, you must get this through your head. <laughs> this, is, this is the classic Luther bravado, that he would be talking like this so, so boldly, but, but so sincerely. Luther writes, you must get this through your head and not doubt that you are the one who is torturing Christ thus. For your sins have surely wrought this. Therefore, when you see the nail piercing Christ's hands, you can be certain that it is your work. When you behold his crown of thorns, you may rest assured that these are your evil thoughts, etc. The theologian of the cross is that Christian who feels their sin who feels their guilt, who feels their shame, and says, Lord Jesus, there is nowhere else I can turn but to you and your cross. Because it is on your cross alone and nowhere else that I find the forgiveness of my sins. It is on your cross and nowhere else that I find the balm, that I feel the medicine for my sin-sick soul. Lord Jesus Christ, Help me to always be a theologian of the cross and nothing else. Luther summarizes his argument in the very last thesis of that Heidelberg Disputation when he writes this. The love of God does not first discover, but creates 
that which is pleasing to it. And the love of man comes into being through attraction to what pleases it. This is what I've been talking about this entire sermon, especially the second point, the love of man, that we would actually want to follow something that we like, something that we like to look at. But I gotta be totally honest with you this morning, that there is nothing in this world that I would sacrifice my family and myself for. Nothing in this world. There is nothing that I would give Marie up and I would give Andrew and Anna up. Nothing in this world that I like so much that I would give up my family. But God says, especially as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, that God showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Us ungodly, us poor, miserable sinners, God actually would send his own son to die for us. That is the extraordinary love of our Father, that he would actually send Jesus to die while we were ugly, while we had sin all over us, while we, while we were guilty. And that's when he would send his son to die. As he says, you know how much you mean to me? I know not a whole lot means, not a, not a lot means anything to you, but you know how much you mean to me? You mean the death of my son. You mean his suffering. You mean his torture. You mean his death for you. That's what I'm willing to give up. Because I love you so, so desperately much. This is good news for us Christians. This is extraordinary love that our God shows to us and even gives to us in his word and in his sacraments. And you see, when we see Jesus on the cross, we actually see the love of our God and the love that he wants to give to us. Because it is our God's good pleasure that we would not only receive the forgiveness of all of our sins and the promise of everlasting life with him, but we would receive everything from Jesus. Everything that is Jesus is ours. And so we receive his suffering, we receive his death, and we receive his resurrection. What do those things look like? When we experience suffering in this life, when we experience hardships, we know that it's not by fate. We know that it's not by some divine accident. That when we actually are in over our heads and we, and we feel it very, very much, that there is nowhere else to turn, we know that we can turn to our Savior's cross. We know that we look to our Savior's suffering because when we experience our suffering, that is when we are closest to our God outside of word and sacrament. When we look at Jesus' death, we know. And when we receive that death as our own, whenever the devil and the world might come upon, might come upon us with assaults, might come upon us with uh, threats, whatever that looks like, we know that we are not in any real danger whether it be sickness, whether it be threats from, from another country, whether it be even threats from our neighbor, we know that it is nothing. Because guess what? We've already died. We've already died the death with our Savior Jesus. So nothing, nothing in this world can hurt us. This is the confidence that we have when we receive Jesus' very own death. We receive Jesus' resurrection. There has been death in this congregation. You and I have mourned the death of our loved ones. Yes, we shed very real tears here and now. But because we have received Jesus' resurrection, those tears are not in vain. Those tears are not hopeless. But they are very much filled with an everlasting hope, a very certain hope that we will see our loved ones someday and that we will actually see our very own bodies resurrected as well when we see our Lord on that very last day face to face. We receive everything that is Jesus's because he has freely promised to give it to us. And so, dear friends in Christ, as we continue this Lenten journey towards Easter, know that each and every step of the way, we see the love of our God. And these 40 days, these six weeks that we spend meditating on the love of our God and meditating on what our sin that brought our Savior there, know that it is, it is a mere enactment it is a mere enactment of our lifelong pilgrimage to that final day when Jesus comes again in glory to take us home. And so throughout these 40 days, let us ever more see clearly the love of our God. The love of our God that does not first look to us and judges us 
and tells us what we are worth based on just our, our plain looking at us, but he tells us how much we're worth. He tells us and he speaks by the words of his son's cross. He says, you are redeemed. You are my child. You are an heir to the kingdom of heaven. And so as we look to the cross and as we see clearly the love of our Lord Jesus, know that we receive our God's good pleasure in his son. Amen. Now may this peace that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now stand and confess our faith according to the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend and I will praise thee without end. Lord Jesus Christ, be mercifully present among all who suffer, leading them to the hope that is only in you. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Lord Jesus Christ, soften our hearts, soften our hearts to all those who, would pro who we would proclaim as our enemies. Remind us that we are weak and ungodly. Bring to our remembrance that you have died for all people. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross you took on our pain and punishment and death. Bring your comfort to all those who are suffering and grief. We remember especially Becky and Steve and uh, Becky and Steve Brown and their family, especially uh, after the death of Becky's mom, Mary Lee Shear. We pray that you would comfort them with the profound reality that you not only died but rose from the dead and will raise us from the dead on the last day to eternal life. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Lord Jesus Christ, Bring your strength and hope to all those who struggle with mental illness. Help them to find the support they need. Remove the stigma around mental illness from our churches and communities. To all those in deepest need, bring your peace and joy. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Lord Jesus Christ, grant that the nations and the peoples of the world might live in peace put an end to all violence and war. Lead us to be the first to beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise thee without end. Lord, look with favor on all who are sick, injured, and recovering. We remember especially Cindy Ucklecamp, Angela Hendrickson, Ron Caston, the persecuted church around the world. 
have mercy on them and lead them out of their suffering to hope. Lord Jesus Christ, my prayer attend, and I will praise Thee without end. We also give you thanks on behalf of Justin and Ashley Terslucy at your gift of a daughter, River Grace, River Grace Terslucy. We pray that you would bring River into our families, for our family through the waters of holy baptism. Lord Jesus, we commend all these people and situations into your hands, for you have promised to hear our prayers and intercede for us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Uh, one announcement is uh, on page 21. You will uh, read a little bit about uh, this uh, Nathan's organist assistant program. Uh, and so he is inviting, uh, I think, third through sixth grade to go uh, and join him uh, up in the choir loft and uh, learn a little bit about the organ. And so uh, I would invite you uh, to take advantage of that. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing. <laughs>